Hello and welcome to the podcast from Le Monde Diplomatique. My name is George Miller, and in this programme I'm talking to journalist Paul Mason about the mood in Britain, among politicians and also the public, as the mid-November hard negotiating deadline for Brexit fast approaches. The progress so far? Not too encouraging. The whole process for those of us on the left of politics has been to try and say to people, OK, we think this, you don't believe us, let's do it your way. So let you, let's have Brexit, let's do a negotiation. That went wrong. Let's put Theresa May in charge if that's what you want. That's gone wrong. And now you're going to see what, if there is a no-deal Brexit, you're going to see queues at supermarkets and see how you like that. The 2016 referendum divided the country almost down the middle. With polls suggesting a majority of Britons would now vote to remain in the EU, Paul Mason visited Newport in South Wales, a Labour Party heartland where 60% voted to leave. He was, he says, looking for the much more complex story of the political dynamics on the ground than the recent polls revealed. He found, as in many other parts of the country, poverty, anxiety about the future and disagreement over what Brexit will mean. I began by asking Paul why he chose to go to South Wales. Two years ago, when we were facing the Brexit referendum itself, I happened to be in that part of South Wales, Newport and the surrounding area. And it was my experience there that convinced me that we were going to lose the referendum and Britain was going to leave the European Union. Because of the way I just heard in casual conversations again and again, elided two issues, one of, of which, of course, was Brexit. Should we leave? Should we stay? The other one just is people's hostility to what they regard as a kind of globalist, urban, cosmopolitan culture. And you you just hear it again and again. And all the subsequent surveys reveal that people thought they were just giving a two fingers, as we say in, in Britain, you know, to the elite, to the establishment by doing Brexit. And so I went back to South Wales two years on just to find out whether anything had changed. And, you know, people from the anti-Brexit movement, the NGOs and the think tanks who are lobbying hard against Brexit are pretty convinced that there has been a swing away from leaving the European Union, particularly among Labour voters. And South Wales is a Labour voting area. Now, I think that, you know, it's good news, bad news. Yes, there has been a bit of a swing. That's what all the surveys and the opinion polls tell us. But it's just not enough to change the, the kind of specific gravity of economic nationalism, xenophobia, racism in some cases, but also this kind of anti-elite culture that is growing up actually probably even stronger. So really what I found is that, yes, what it may be 9% of people have swung from leaving to staying in, but the, the kind of vehemence and the emotion behind the leave sentiment is still pretty strong. Obviously, the UK has not yet left the EU, so, so actual practical effects of, of that decision have not yet been felt. So I guess it's a big question, but what do you think some of the factors which are shaping either retrenchment or a shift in people's opinions? What, what, do, you, what do you think are the things that sort of matter in, in, um, in those? It's quite amusing to see the kind of centrist liberal political class confounded in knowing what to do in the current situation because they're saying look you know uh, it'll be terrible the economy will collapse but they said that you know they said that would happen the day after the referendum if, if people voted leave and it didn't happen meanwhile we've got the conservative government saying no we'll do a deal and even now you know we've got people even as we speak you know Michel Barnier is meeting various British politicians and there's lots of soothing noises coming from both Brussels and Westminster and it's one thing to say to people, you should revolt now against this thing you voted for. But if you spent 30 years inculcating a kind of blind dogmatic trust and paternalism in politics, then why would people revolt that people generally have been taught to believe what governments tell them? And I think a lot of leave voters want to believe that the economy will be better. Though those like me who think it will not have no practical evidence to show them other than the concerns of various automobile companies and, and companies like Airbus who are saying we, they might disinvest. We'll see. 
whether or not that happens. Because the thing that we, we, we've noticed in the last two years is that all the same companies that are now making threatening noises about this investment uh, were making very soothing noises straight after the vote. So, you know, the average person doesn't isn't waiting for the latest press release from Nissan, Nissan or Renault. They're just getting on with their lives. And so the mixed messages that have come from business didn't help either. So there's a kind of there's kind of almost a, a fatalistic desire just to to take the medicine and get it over with, I think, isn't there? That, that, I've well, noticed that sort of... I just don't think people accept there will be medicine or of any great discomfort. And I think they're wrong. But they'll only know, they'll learn by doing that. The whole process for those of us on the left of politics has been to try and say to people, OK, we think this, you don't believe us, let's do it your way. So let you, let's have Brexit, let's do a negotiation, that went wrong. Let's put Theresa May in charge if that's what you want, that's gone wrong. And now you're going to see what, if there is a no-deal Brexit, you're going to see queues at supermarkets and see how you like that. But you can't, I think... Brexit politically is very unusual because it's a bit like a very dramatic sort of European Champions League cup tie. You know, literally in the last minute, everything could change. It's a series of dramatic swings where people's attitudes change dramatically. I mean, look at the experience of Corbyn and Labour in the June 2017 election. They were nowhere at the start and they nearly won. And I think we could see yet more swings of, of temperament and political kind of culture and and not all of them are positive not all of them might be positive i think that we have yet to see what a really xenophobic conservative leadership would look like we may be unlucky enough to get that in the shape of boris johnson Uh, if you arm somebody like johnson with the trappings of state power they have a lot of power they have a lot of communicative power that i think will be dangerous I mean, you say if Brexit fails, where where will those who voted for it go? How will they react? How realistic do you think we're talking? We're talking in early October. I mean, how realistic do you think it is that there will be a second vote and that Brexit will be reversed? Is that just wishful thinking? I think it is wishful thinking. The only way you can get a second vote is to have a different government and a different House of Commons. There isn't a majority in the House of Commons for any form of the second referendum, because the only situation under which it could be called during Theresa May's premiership would be if she felt she needed a referendum to seal a deal that she had done. And I just think at that point, Labour are not going to back that. But if she has to call a referendum because there is no deal and everything's in chaos, then likewise, I just think, I just think the opposition parties are not united enough to, to make it happen. I do think it would be principled to ratify the eventual deal in a second referendum. But that needs, first of all, a deal. And I suspect it's going to need a a change of government. And for people who are listening outside the UK, why is it that the British Labour Party has found it so hard to come out and clearly say what its position is, what it would really like to happen as regards Brexit? What it chose to do was to oppose, to say, well, in the British constitutional system, the opposition is the opposition. We have a series of red lines that we say, if a deal done does not deliver the following, we'll vote against it. I think that was a good position. It allowed them, because remember, their strategic problem is a third of their own voters voted for Brexit. All of the places they need to win to form a government voted for Brexit. Next 50 seats they need to win are small towns, ex-industrial towns, where whatever the politics, the official politics say, whatever it says, in, in, where you can read in Wikipedia who came first, who came second. The reality is in the pubs, in the clubs, at the school gate, there are two politics on offer. One is Labour and one is UKIP. Even though UKIP's collapsed as a party, its ethos and its politics are strong. You know, in the place I visited in South Wales, one of the places, Merthyr, Merthyr Tidville, it's a, it's a valley community, an old coal mining community. There are 17,000 people signed up to a closed Facebook group, which the Labour politicians cannot join, which is a mixture of what you might call legitimate grievance against a Labour-run council with all kinds of other myths 
and legends that are associated with xenophobia and racism, like the, the proposal that there are lots of Muslim grooming gangs who attack young women. Now, you know, this is a core celebra for the far right in Britain. It's wrong. Obviously, there are grooming gangs. There's nothing specifically Muslim about them. But the fact is that civil society has moved online and behind closed doors. And when I talk to other journalists and other campaigners, they are aware of how dangerous this is and how wrong it would be. Uh, you, you know, if you're looking at this from outside, you, you could think, well, the experience of the two years of chaos has probably taught people to come back into line with liberal centrism. It hasn't. If anything, I would say those communities are more fractured politically, more scratchy, more discontented. And we are lucky in a way that UKIP has gone down the route of becoming more like a a kind of Vilda style or even AfD style far right party because there's a gap really in politics at the moment. So Labour, I think, does need to be more positive about what its end game is. And it, I think it, I, I would have liked it to have done so as soon as the Chequers deal failed, as soon as Chequers fell apart, the, the you know, the the ridiculous situation of the cabinet more or less collapsing two two days after they signed a, a deal. That was the moment for me when Corbyn should have come out and said, look, we can do a deal. Here's what it's going to look like. But in fact, there is hostility among Labour's negotiating team towards the kind of deal that I think that, that they're going to have to do, which is a Norway-style deal. What the Salzburg summit revealed is that Europe really will only accept either a free trade agreement or a Norway-style deal. And I think they're currently pushing Theresa May towards a free trade agreement. I think that's the interesting thing. Labour cannot do a free trade agreement. It, it, it won't satisfy the, the Northern Ireland issue, and it will lead to deindustrialization and disinvestment. So they have to do something like Norway. And I've spoken personally to some of you know, Labour's negotiating team. Remember, this is not all Corbyn. These are other ministers, other potential shadow ministers. They just don't buy Norway. Now, I think that they will have to go through their, say, the same experience that Theresa May did in Salzburg. They're gonna, it's either Norway or it's Canada uh, or it's no deal. And Labour can only sign up to one of those things. And I wish they would actually get on and start presenting a positive argument for a EFTA EEA membership, accepting the four freedoms, changing the labour market to probably Denmark style, you know, being able to limit the amount of time people who move here under freedom of movement can stay if they don't have a job. We've seen you know, changes to, and I hope the end of the posted workers directive. All of these things could be sold to the British population. And I think that uh, the time to do it is fast approaching. Now, when you wrote in the paper, Paul, in the immediate aftermath of the referendum, you said you thought one of its effects would be to accelerate Scotland leaving the UK and therefore yeah. the breakup of the UK. Has anything has anything changed in, in your opinion or do, do you still think that's that's a very likely outcome? Well, in, in a way, instead of accelerating it, it put it on hold because uh, there is an acute, there's a kind of triangle of forces in Scotland. One is the progressive independence movement. It's not even nationalist in, in many cases. It's a movement for economic independence that has simply doesn't trust the proposals for autonomy that they've been, been given, none of which are st as strong, for example, as Catalonia already has. So they just don't trust the idea of greater federation and they want independence. Then there are unionists. And the interesting thing is that the Conservatives were nowhere until the possibility of, a, of an independence vote and a secession looked real. And conservatism in Scotland has recovered as unionism. And the real problem Labour then has in Scotland is whenever it can talk about economics and economic grievance, it does well. But whenever it has to talk about either Brexit or the Scottish national question, it gets squeezed between these two poles of revived conservatism and Scottish nationalism. So right now, you know, the, the last two years have been basically the interplay of these three forces. However, if there's a hard Brexit, if there's a Canada style free trade deal or if there is no deal, I think that will push the Scottish nationalists towards a new ref a new independence referendum. And it will, will force Labour pretty point blank in Scotland to say to people, what is the future of Scotland inside of Britain that has cut itself adrift from Europe. Now, of course, 
the Scots need reciprocal support. They need Brussels, they need the EU27 to be really clear uh, that there will be a rapid in reintegration path. Otherwise, just as before, the inability to join the European Union becomes a weapon that Westminster then uses against Scotland. So I, I think the next phase of the Scottish independence struggle starts when we know what Brexit actually means. Again, in one of your earlier pieces, you, you wrote about the cultural narrative in Great Britain being shattered. Does it still feel that, that we're, we're picking over the pieces and trying to, to make sense of, of what's happened? I think there is a weird bifurcation. The political class is obsessed with Brexit. The people are not obsessed with Brexit. There's a, bit, a degree of shock among European commentators when they hear so many British people say, look, you know, we voted for Brexit, get on with it. Why don't we just leave and, and just you know, do our own thing as if it were really simple? But that is the level of kind of political simplicity that 30 years of free market economics has, has created you know, among large parts of the populace. They just don't understand the complexities of it. And even if they did, they probably still have the same attitude. So the upside of this kind of insouciance about, well, we can just leave, is that people in general do talk about other things. During the June 2017 general election, which was ostensibly called all about Brexit by Theresa May, I remember doing a, a kind of rabble-rousing speech for about 100 Labour campaigners in quite a pro-Brexit area, saying, look, on the doorstep, they're going to be angry, they're going to be annoyed, here's the arguments they're going to throw at you, what are you going to say? We put our, put our coats on, went out, knocked on doors, Brexit wasn't mentioned. It was, it was what's going to happen about my, the road the hole in the road outside my house, what's going to happen about the school, what's going to happen about the local hospital. Actually, that politics is politics in Britain, and it's the pretty intimate knowledge of that that Labour gets from having 500,000 members plus that has allowed them to take the gamble of being non-specific about the end game on Brexit. And it's not illogical once you understand that Brexit is a minority sport on all sides. I was talking to Paul Mason about his article, Bad News from Newport, which appears in the October 2018 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. It's available in the print edition and on the website at mondediplo.com, as are Paul's previous articles on the state of the nation from one and two years ago. You can read the current issue online and access a complete archive of the paper going back over 20 years as well as exploring other resources such as maps, images, the podcast archive and online exclusive content. And if you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of content online to entice you to become one and full details on how to go about it. In the words of the late John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again next month for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.